and we're live uh, uh, hello my friends from everywhere in the world welcome to this dev nation workshop we're so glad to have you today here i know it's good morning afternoon evening somewhere in the world so we're super glad to have you here and this definition workshop, we're going to be talking a bit about Kafka, about OpenShift streams. And I'll be joined today by my colleagues and friends, uh, Jennifer, Evan, and Bernard. Uh, you'll be seeing uh, them very shortly. And what is today's agenda? We're going to learn a bit about Quarkus and Kafka. I'm going to show you a very quick demo of how, of how exciting can be a Quarkus and Kafka can be together. Then later, we're going to learn a bit about Red Hat OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka. We're going to go through the workshop overview and log in details. Uh, we're going to go through the, uh, uh, perform a walkthrough for the quick starts. And then you'll be able to perform the things by yourself. We have a lot of time for Q&A and Last but not least, the next steps. What's next regarding the Red Hat OpenShift streams, Apache Kafka, and Quarkus as well, OK? But let's talk first about the technology. Uh, I want to show you how Quarkus and Kafka can be super exciting. So I'm going to skip the slides for now. And I'm going to show you now your new favorite website on the internet, which is quarkus.io. Quarkus has new, release every, uh, re new releases every other week. And you can see here that uh, here in this particular uh, uh, image, uh, Quarkus won the 2021 Stevie Wiener Award, like a best framework or something, uh, which means that, yes, a lot of people are paying attention to Quarkus and how amazing Quarkus can be. But for today's experience, we are going to start with the top right corner of the screen. We're going to click the Start Coding button which is going to start our amazing experience. OK, so Quarkus today, we're going to use version 113.7 final. And the only boring part of this presentation is that I'll have to type the group, the group ID, Comrade Head Developers, and the artifact ID, which is going to be Kafka Workshop. Uh, what else? Uh, I'm going to need some uh, REST extensions because everybody's doing REST endpoints to, uh, these days. So REST easy and reactive. So I want to use REST easy reactive because we want to be super performant when using uh, Quarkus and Kafka. So I'm going to add some reactivity here. I also want to show some JSON maybe. And uh, what else? I also need the Kafka stuff. So I'm going to add the small Rye reactive messaging Kafka connector because we want to do that all the way. And I believe that's all that I needed for now. So I have some options here. I can generate my application, downloading a zip file, pushing to GitHub, or sharing a link with you. So I'm going to download the zip file for now. So yes, the zip file is already on my machine. And let's move to the terminal. So you note that here on this particular tab, I already have a Kafka instance working on my machine. You'll be able to do the same later using the, the Red Hat OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka. But I'm just doing it for localhost because I don't want to spoil the surprise you have later, the good surprise you have later. And uh, I, let's see if I'm in the right folder. So let's unzip the file that I just downloaded. Kafka Workshop, you see that this is a plain old a Maven, Java Maven project. We could be using Gradle as well, but uh, I'm a Maven user uh, because of bad choices. And uh, some of my favorite features of Quarkus, actually one of my favorite features, is when the magic happens. So I'm going to type the magic words, MVN, Quarkus, colon, dev. And in this particular mode, Quarkus is going to start in development mode and is going to listen for changes in the file system. So whenever I change, for example, a uh, Java file or properties file or any other kind of file, Quarkus will trigger a restart. And it's going to happen super fast. You barely even note. When I'm not live streaming content, such as today, usually Quarkus takes about 200 milliseconds, 150, 180 milliseconds to be able to restart. And I can tell you that from my previous experience using Node.js, it's much faster than Node.js. And of course, as something can always go wrong, Quarkus released a new version, and I didn't download it previously to this demo. That's why Maven is downloading the internet in front of your eyes. And I think it's going to take just a few uh, seconds more. But while we're doing that, we can always open another tab. And now we're go I'm going to open my ID. 
Okay. Hello. Waiting more. Oh, now even my terminal is slow. Yes. So let me see if I'm on the right folder. Yes, correctly. So let's hope open my new five favorite ID these days, which is Visual Studio Code for Java with the Java extension and the Quarkus extension, which are both provided by Red Hat. Okay. And I'm waiting. OK, you didn't see that because my v VS Code Oh, God. Apparently, I have a new version today as well. Do I trust the authors? Well, I think I'll have to trust myself. And yes, I'm trusting myself. So let's show you the screen. And yes, very big font. Here I have the my project. You note that uh, I even have a new reactive point here, which is generated by default. And let's go back to the browser and see if my project is already working. So localhost 8080. Yes, my new cloud native application is ready. And I could even go to the hello rest easy reactive point just to say that yes, hello rest easy reactive is working. So what do I want to show you? Uh, I have a Kafka broker. So we are going to be sending some messages to my Kafka broker. And I'll be able to consume those messages in a reactive way, in a real time way, using Quarkus and Kafka. For me to be able to do that, I'm going to create a new endpoint here, a new file, which is going to be a message resource, uh, correctly, of course, message resource.java. And it's going to be a class. It's going to be a path. And yeah, things are kind of slow today on my machine. But it's going to be path, it's going to be message. And I can import the right class later. And while I'm doing that, I can say create a new endpoint, a public. We're going to be using a new reactive type called, called multi. Then I'll be able to uh, set, show you the messages on the fly. Uh, let's keep it simple. Uh, I'm going to return a string, uh, strings and this messages. And what else do I need here? I need another path. And actually, just needs to be a get endpoint. It's going to produce. Let's do a server sent events type and RSS element type is going to be media type dot text plane. Okay, so it's going to be server sent events, and my server sent events is going to be text plane. And that's all I needed for my endpoint. And what is what is the rest of the magic happening? Well, I just need to declare here another multi, which is going to be injected automatically, automatically, or automatically, if you prefer. And uh, if I just add this annotation channel and say that the name is going to be message input because that's the that's the stream that's the stream that I'm going to receive from Kafka and return the messages that I just injected. And that's it. That's all I need to do to be able to create a reactive REST endpoint that is receiving messages from Kafka and showing that on the screen, on my browser, using server sent events. Uh, what else do I need to do? Well, I never told my application, where is my Kafka broker? So I can do that by using my application properties file. So I'll have to type some properties, which can be lengthy. Uh, but luckily, we have our ID, which is able to autocomplete most of these properties for us. And just because, oh, yes, uh, uh, Kafka, small right Kafka, uh, bootstrap servers. And this one is running a, on a different port, 2992. And then I'll have to configure uh, messaging, incoming. And I think for the sake of time, I'll just copy paste those properties because I don't want to entertain you with my typing, but I want to entertain you with, with Quarkus and Kafka. So what did I have to do here? I just had to say that I created a new reactive stream using Kafka. The name of the topic that I'm going to consume is message. And because of the nature of Kafka, I can use many different serialization formats in my messages. I chose to use a string as the, as the deserializer of my particular messages. OK? And I think that's it. Once I did that, I'm ready to connect. So if I go here to my browser, I type localhost 8080 slash message. 
you see that nothing is happening but the name message input I uh, didn't find anything message input I might must have mistyped it should be good yeah sometimes these things happens because uh, while Quark is restarting but once you've noticed you just ignore the error message because here on the top of the screen you see that my browser is already connected to my server set events endpoint and is waiting for something to come from Kafka so let's uh, split the screen here. So I'm going to go back here to my ter terminal. And how do I send messages to my Kafka broker? Well, I'm going to use the CLI command ca called Kafka Cat. So with Kafka Cat, I can just specify that my broker is on this uh, host and port 992. And I want to connect to, to the topic called message. And I want to connect as a producer. So I just did that. And by doing and typing enter here, I should be connected to my Kafka broker now. Okay, and once connected, I just can just type stuff and these things will go through Kafka. And luckily and hopefully, these will be received by my Quarkus application on the right side of the screen and it will show on the fly. So let's start with some hello. As soon as I send hello, something should have happened here. And let's see if I'm working. And just because I mentioned that, let me stop and start Quarkus again, because, you know, with software development, sometimes it's uh, always a good choice for you to be able to restart your stuff. And I've just sent something. Hello. And we should be good. connecting again, waiting for it. A stream with the name message input available streams are that's that's weird. Let's see what I'm missing here. Uh, channel did I tap the wrong channel? Message input. Oh, I never saved the file. Oh, come on. You, all, you know that you have to save your files. I never save the file. That's why Quarkus is complaining. So it wasn't Quarkus fault. It was my fault. Now it should be working. Okay, let's go back to the terminal and let's see if I say hello. Yes, hello is working. I can add some French, bonjour. I can add some Portuguese or Spanish. I can say hola. And since I'm running Quarkus on dev mode, I can go back here to my Visual Studio code. And if I just decide to go to the message resource, see if you ever used it, Java 8 streams before, you notice that the, the multi-type is very similar. I can even map the messages. So suppose that I want to show everything upper, up, as uppercase right now, and I can say string. I'm going to use a method reference here, string to uppercase. And just by doing that, I can go back to the browser and back to the terminal and just send a refresh here. And if I send hello again, Oops, I was too fast. So hello, it's already kept on here. I can add bonjour. I can say some Hawaiian, aloha. I can say some hola. And you see that Quarkus restarts on the fly. You have this amazing experience. And it's super easy for you to be able to play with Quarkus and Kafka once you saved files that you just edited. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this particular demo. And remember, this is just the start. This is just the beginning. We have much more uh, uh, cool stuff to show you during this half an hour of this amazing Quarkus workshop. And to help you uh, with, the f uh, with the rest of the workshop, I'm uh, inviting Jennifer to join us on the stage. Hey, Edson. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for that uh, demo on. Quark. So I'm going to go now and share my presentation. Give me a couple of minutes here while I move the screens. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As Edson said, we're going to walk through this uh, wonderful workshop. I hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoy preparing it for you. So um, the first thing I want to introduce today is Red Hat OpenShift Streams for Apache Kafka. We launched this service during uh, a Red Hat Summit event in April. And uh, it's right now it's a development release, development preview release, and we are work working towards the GA of the product. So um, I just kind of wanted to 
put like a situation here, like a baseline for all of us. So basically Red Hat is expanding its open hybrid cloud technology portfolio with a new set of managed cloud services that include platform services, application services, and data services. So all of them are uh, the main objective of the main benefits is that we want to provide a full stack management and unify experience. We're hoping to maximize the full value of Red Hat OpenShift as well as support uh, across, uh, support everything across the hybrid cloud environments. So on the bottom, you can see here the platform service. That's one of our first uh, services that is our, our base. And basically what we have there is that we provide fully managed OpenShift on the cloud provider of your choice. Uh, we also, and you can see here, we currently support a few options for our customers. Um, the next layer, or on top of that, we have designed a new set of cloud services that are natively integrated with OpenShift. And the goal is to deliver a streamlined developer experience that would allow not only developers, but also the organization to be able to build, deploy, manage, and scale cloud native applications applications across hybrid um, environments. But what is really Red Hat OpenShift Streams for Apache Kafka? You're here for that today. And it's a fully hosted and managed Kafka service for stream-based applications. And this service was designed for IT development teams that want to incorporate streaming data into applications to deliver experiences in real time and also to improve application velocity. So what isn't really in for you and for the organizations or for any developer or organization that wants to start using this today? Uh, and the first thing is faster application velocity. Uh, one of the things that we give you is that as soon as you, and you did it, you have done it in the last few minutes that we've been here in this workshop, you uh, were able to go to the links that we gave you on the workshop guide and, um, Create, create your own Kafka instance, right? So that's what we're trying to do, give you an environment where you can quickly go and um, start developing immediately, start making the change immediately. It's designed for developers. The second one is that we're providing you a unified experience across all clouds. Our goal is to make it very easy for you that when you're using Kafka or using any of our managed cloud services that you can seamlessly connect acro applications across public and hybrid clouds. So you can actually respond to this uh, hybrid cloud, cloud experience or make it easier for you and your organization. And finally, we know that Kafka is not only Kafka. Um, we are working very hard on delivering a Kafka ecosystem that really allows you to um, uh, deliver these stream-based applications, okay? So we are working on a curated set of cloud services that will simplify um, that work. Uh, so what is in the proverbial box for this managed Kafka solution? And the first one is that um, we provide you with um, a single tenant instance that is fully managed, okay? It's fully hosted and managed by Red Hat. Um, and uh, so as you can see here in the box, the main thing that we have is a Kafka cluster, but there is much more than that for our Kafka instance. And that's what we have built as an organization. So you have metrics and monitorings, you have configuration management. We have also worked very hard on the UI uh, experience for the developers. You have a UI, you have a CLI. Uh, we are also exposing, exposing the APIs of the application so you can potentially create, connect to your own CLI. And also we included something very important that we will be talking later on today, which is a service binding. So the service binding is an operator that's gonna be the one that is responsible and allows you to control the communication between an OpenShift cluster and your Kafka service, okay? Um, and on top of that, besides everything that we added to this box, there's one thing that's very important is that we um, are committed to provide a 99.95% SLI. And we, and we also offer, or we're including 24 seven global premium support. 
besides that uh to talk a little bit more about the cli we have something that's called the red hat openshift application services cli it's a very long name we know that let's call it cli for now you will also hear our instructors calling it rose cli but basically it's a command line interface that will allow you to develop allow developers to manage uh, application services so anything that has to do with the cloud services so you can do it from a terminal and it allows you to do basic and advanced commands so you can create a kafka instance you can create a service account you can do different update delete view topic list among many other things uh, so right now this um version of the service as i told you is development preview uh and we will be working for um final ga version by the end of the year um one thing long names short names names <laughs> the reason why i add this is because um we know red hat openshift streams for apache kafka is the official name it's a bit long so sometimes you know you get tired you want to move fast we you're gonna hear us use things like rosac which is the acronym sounds kind of weird uh, it doesn't flow that easy so you might hear people talking about manage kafka or just Kafka. Our preferred name is OpenShift Streams because it's very close to our um, product name and it's a preferred short ver version, but I just kind of wanted to let you know that this might happen. So a couple of things uh, before we keep going. Uh, make sure that you review the documents that the team is sharing with you on the chat so you can keep creating your Kafka instances. We're gonna walk you through that anyway later on. Uh, and the second thing I wanted to say is um, you can help us out with the research. You can help us out with the UI. You can help us out. We can capture uh, your ideas. This is your opportunity. If you go to this link here, you can also use the uh, QR code. Uh, come, please share with you your feedback, your experience. Let us know what you think. This is very helpful for our um, UI team or UX team. Um, one of the things that we are putting a lot of effort with these cloud services is making sure that develop that, that there's a developer experience and their experience is for you and, and we would love to capture your feedback and your thoughts so what are we going to cover today and i hope i didn't take too much time with the intro i know it's important but i wanted to make sure that we all level set on what is kafka and why are you here today right so the first thing the agenda for today we are going to get started with OpenShift streams, OK? Uh, we also want you to get started on getting the developer sandbox uh, for your OpenShift environment. So you're going to have two environments, your Kafka and your OpenShift environment. Um, we are going to walk you through how to you can use Kafka Cut with OpenShift streams, something similar to what Edson showed before, a different use case, of course. And then you are going to be able to connect OpenShift streams with the Rose CLI. We are going to help you out to bind the OpenShift streams to um, the OpenShift environment itself. You're going to deploy your Quarkus app. And at the end of the day, you're going to bind your Quarkus app to your Kafka instance so you can actually um, send information back and forward. So let me, let's make sure you have all you need for these workshops. First, make sure that you have your Red Hat account and you have your credentials handy. Second being, let's uh, be able to uh, request a Kafka instance. You can also go and request a uh, developer sandbox. That's pretty easy as well. All instructions are on the workshop guide. Regardless of that, I'm going to move you now to um, Bernard, who's going to walk you through these steps as well as Evan. Uh, we are all here for questions. Please let us know how you're doing. Uh, Bernard, are you here with me? <laughs> yes, I am. Do you hear me? Awesome. Yes, I can hear you. Do okay. you want to share or do you want me to keep well, I can. I can share if awesome. I find the button. It's at the bottom, at the end, where you have your mute vote button. Yes. There it is. There's a monitor there. So share. Do you see my screen? Something it's all perfect. Start walkthrough? Yes, I can see okay. it. Thanks. So I have just a couple of slides. Thank you, Jennifer, for the intro. 
So uh, I have just two slides and then we will dive directly into the practical stuff. So what we're gonna do today, and Jennifer already mentioned that, we basically have two environments. We have what you see on this slide on the right side, we have our Kafka service, uh, which we asked you to already provision. Now, if you didn't, you can do it together with me in a couple of minutes. So I walk you through it, how you, how, how, how you can do it. So, uh, so we're gonna provision a Kafka service running on cloudradar.com somewhere in the cloud. And then we will have another environment uh, through which we're gonna interact with our Kafka service. And that's the developer sandbox. Now for those who are not familiar with developer sandbox, so it's a OpenShift environment, which is geared towards developer. And basically through, if you have a Red Hat account ID, you can get free of charge during I think 30 days. And then you can do it again. Obviously you get like a piece a of a shared OpenShift cluster, mm -hmm. so uh, all for yourself, and then you can you can let's say do some POCs, play around with uh, with an OpenShift uh, environment. Okay, so obviously this is really targeted at initial development phases. So for you to play around with things, this is not meant for production. As I said, after thirty days, it goes away, and you will you would have to re start your uh, your dev sandbox but it's a very useful tool we think for getting people acquainted with with openshift okay so that's what we're going to use then to deploy quarkus app and stuff and then uh, connect to uh, to the kafka instance so we're going to do this by guiding you through four quick starts which are available from the dev sandbox and which will bring us through four, let's say, small exercises, uh, which uh, have like a logical sequence. So we're gonna start with getting started. So meaning provisioning a, uh, a Kafka instance, creating a service account, creating a first topic. Then we are gonna use Kafka Cut to connect to our uh, managed Kafka instance and produce some messages and consume some messages. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Then I'm going to hand over to Evan and Evan is then going to show, show you how you can use the row CLI to, uh, to, uh, connect to your Apache, uh, your Apache Kafka instance. And then finally, how you can bind a Quarkus application really easily to a managed Kafka instance. So those are like the four quick starts that I'm going to, me and Evan are going to walk you through. And I think that's what I have for slides. So let's get that out of the way and let's dive directly into, into provisioning a Kafka instance. So we have like a, uh, a vanity URL, which is, which I'm gonna type in here. So that's, uh, uh, dot ht dry Kafka. And if I go to that one, this will bring me directly in, in a certain page on the developers .com. On that page, I see a nice red button saying create a Kafka instance, which I'm going to do. And this brings me, will bring me to cloudreader.com, but first I have to log in. So um, with my uh, with my Red Hat account ID, and then I need a password that I don't know by heart. So I need to look it up. There you go. Right, and this will bring me to the. Kafka instances view of, so we are on cloudredhead.com in the application services uh, perspective. And there you see, we have like a streams for Apache Kafka uh, menu. And the first item of the menu is Kafka instances. And you see, I don't have a Kafka instance at the moment. So to create one, I click the blue button. And this will open this, uh, this pop-up which asks me for a Kafka instance name. So that's just a name. So let's call it Def Nation. 
then, but this is not so. I'm I'm, I'm not sure if Jennifer uh, mentioned that at the moment. So the service is in what we call development preview. So the choices and stuff like that are a bit restricted at the moment. It, as part of this development preview program, everybody with a Red Hat account ID can provision one Kafka instance, totally free of charge, no credit card required, uh, with some limitations that the Kafka instance will stay up for 48 hours. And there are some other limitations with regard to ingress, storage, and, and things like that, which are enumerated on the right-hand side of this pop-up. Uh, so, but you you so everybody's entitled to create one kafka instance so that's what i'm doing now so i've given the name i cannot choose my cloud provider it's gonna run on amazon i at this moment i also cannot choose my cloud region uh, so in the context of the development preview everything runs in virginia and uh, also the availability zone it's multi by default so the only thing you have to type in here is your name the name of, of your instance, and then you create, you click create instance, and then you will see that the instance is listed in the Kafka instance of view, and it says creation pending, and this will normally take a couple of minutes, should not take more than three, max four minutes. So while this is going, uh, we can move to, I can guide you through getting to the developer sandbox. So for this, I will open a new tab. I need to, so the URL is, that I'm gonna go to is developers.redhat.com developer-sandbox. Okay, so if I click there, you will see that, oh, yes. Uh, I come to the to the landing page for the developer sandbox with a blue button here, get started in the sandbox. So let's do that. And then go to another page that says launch your developer sandbox for Red Hat OpenShift, which I'm gonna click as well. And then you see that the, the view changes. It says now start using your sandbox. So if you do that the first time, that might take a couple of seconds to provision your share of that uh, of that OpenShift cluster. I've I've done that before for my account, so I can start using it immediately. So start using your sandbox, and this will bring me to the login screen of uh, of OpenShift, and to log in, I click on the dev sandbox button here and this will log me in into my uh, dev sandbox so it uses the same id that i used to log in into uh openshift stream through apache kafka so my user id was btison uh dash dev nation and i have like a namespace which is dash dev. I have another one that's called dev stage, but we're gonna do everything in dash dev. So that's, uh, now I'm on a developer sandbox. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through those four quick starts. So to get to those quick start, you have this quick start card. If you click on view all quick starts, you will see there are more quick start than just the Apache streams one. And I think they're kind of, of alphabetically uh, ordered. So I need to find the first one, which is get started with Apache OpenShift streams for uh, get, getting started with Red Hat OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka. Uh, and if I click start the tour, this will bring me to the first screen of that. So let's go back first to uh, my OpenShift streams view and my cluster is still being created. So let's give that hopefully not too much time. No, there we go. It's ready. So now I can start using uh, that, uh, that Kafka instance. So let's go through the first quick start. So where are we gonna do three tasks? We're gonna inspect our Kafka instance. We're gonna create a service account. 
and then we're going to create a topic. So the first to go to a task, you click on the link. I'm not going to read all this. Uh, so we, I've already basically done the first step. So that's create an instance. So if you have done that together with me, your instance should be ready as well. If you've done it before, you already have an instance. So I can skip that first uh, step. Check my work. Is the new Kafka instance listed in the instances table? Yes, it is. Is the state ready? Yes, it is. So I can go to the next step. So the next step is create a service account. So uh, the managed uh, Kafka instances are secured with service accounts. So and a service account basically is a username and a password. We call it a client ID and a client secret. So you need one of those to be able to connect to your Kafka instance. So that's the next step you need to do is create a service account. So I'm gonna do that directly in my uh, streams view. So going back to the UI. So if I click on, my, on the line of my uh, Kafka instance, I click the three dots icon on the right. You will see that the middle menu item is view connection information. If I click on that, this pop-up, and this pop-up, first of all, shows already a very important thing. That's the bootstrap server, which we're going to need to be able to connect. So obviously, to connect to Kafka, I need a URL, a, uh, and so which is called the bootstrap server URL, and that's this one. So I'm going to copy this by clicking on this copy location and I'm going to paste that in a text editor that I have ready for this so that I can find it back easily afterwards. So that's done. And then the next step is creating a service account. And for this, I'm going to click the create service account button, which is opening a other pop-up. So a service account has a name as well. I'm going to call this one Dev Nation, just to be consistent. I can give it a description, but I'm going to skip that for the moment. And then if I create, this will open yet another dialog. Uh, in the meantime, the service account is created. And then you see like two important items. That's the client ID and the client secret. And what's really important is that I have to copy the values of those, especially the client secret, because once I close this window, I cannot get back to it. So I'm going to copy both items, so the client ID, and paste them in my text editor. And I'm going to copy the client secret as well and paste that. So we will need both. So they. So we're going to use those as username and password to connect to your Kafka instance uh, later on. So once I have copied them, I can click. I have copied the client ID and secret, and I can close that window. And now I have a service account. So if I close this pop-up as well, and on this, uh, on the left side menu, I go to service accounts, which is just beneath Kafka instances. You will see that my uh, my service account is listed here. So I can I can potentially reset it, and this will create for the same ID a new secret, but I can't get to the secret again. So if I really forgot about it, I can always create. Just delete the service account as well and create another one. In the context of the de development preview program, you are limited to two service accounts per uh, per Kafka instance. Uh, obviously, when we go GA, those limitations will be a lot more lenient. So uh, now I have a service account. So that was the next step I needed to do. So back to my quick start. So I've done all this. I copied the generated client ID. Uh, so now we can go to the next step, which is creating a Kafka topic. So if I click next, check your work. Did I save the bootstrap server endpoint? Yes. Did I save the client credential? Yes. 
So I'm ready to continue. And now the, the last step in this quick start is creating a Kafka topic. So without going too much into detail about how Kafka works, so Kafka is a messaging platform, a streaming platform, and basically uh, you send and consume messages from topics. So without topics, your Kafka cluster is fairly useless. So to be able to send messages or to consume messages, you send them to a topic and you consume from a topic. Okay, so to be able to do something useful with our Kafka instance, we need to create a topic. And this can be done from the UI as well. Now, just for uh, uh, for completeness, you can do all the same thing with the row CLI as well. But because I guess for most of you, this is the first time that you interact with uh, OpenShift streams, the UI is probably the easiest way to get started. Once you get more familiar, you can do things. On, or if you prefer command line, you can do the same thing to the row CLI. And some of those uh, functionalities, Evan is going to walk you through. But I'm going to do that through the UI. So back to the UI, back to my Kafka instance instance overview page. So if I click now on my Kafka instance, this should open another window, which will show me the topics. And as you can imagine, because I didn't create any topics yet, this overview window is empty and it presents me with me with a button create topic if i click that topic uh this will guide me through like four steps uh and at every steps i will be able to fill in some things that are important for my topic so the first thing is obviously a topic needs a name so i'm gonna call this one my first kafka topic right so that's the name. And then it asks me how much partitions do I want. So again, I don't want to go too much into details, but on Kafka, a topic can consist of one to potentially very high number of partitions, not unusual to have topics that have hundreds of partitions. So basically a partition is a subset of a particular topic. So when you send messages to a topic, the topic, the messages will be divided over the number of partitions. So if you have only one, there's only one partition. But if you have 15 partitions, for instance, uh, your, uh, so your, uh, your message will be divided over those partitions. And then when you consume the message, you will consume from one or more partitions. So the more partitions you have, the more you can scale out, especially from the consuming side, because you can have several consumers that each consume only a, an, an, a, a subset of the total number of partitions, so you can scale out very easily your consumers. Now, for this, for this uh, demo here, I'm going to keep it to one partition. Typically, for a production system, what I generally do for my demos and stuff like that, I have like, I do a default of 15 partitions, but if you have like uh, a very high load, uh, it's not unusual to have topics that have, as I said, several hundreds of, of partitions. I'm gonna keep that, uh, keep it to one here. So one partition. And then I need to make a couple of choices with regards to message retention. So in its essence, Kafka is a distributed journal. So that means a topic is, if you want, a journal of messages, which means that, uh, which is typical for a journal, things stay there forever. So which has a number of advantages in the sense that if I create a topic, I start producing messages for a topic. If now I, uh, I connect a consumer, the consumer can always start consuming from the beginning of the topic, even if that topic has been there for days or weeks or months. So because the messages uh, are stored as, 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 as a journal, so they, uh, they, uh, they are retained, they are persisted 
potentially forever. Now, forever, obviously, that's a bit relative. Uh, everything you store in IT needs storage. So in practice, you might want not to retain things forever, but you might say, okay, if things, if my messages, depending on your use case, obviously, but a lot of use cases could, if, if consumers have not consumed messages within a day, those messages are not important anymore. If you do something like a, uh, uh, you want to show uh, stocks, stock, uh, stock tellers, so stock prices, obviously you're definitely, you might not be interested in the stock price of the day before, you're interested in the latest one. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to consume messages that are a, a day old. So you can, to, on a topic by topic basis, you can configure how long you want to, re you, you want to retain messages in a topic. You can do that by time or by size. So the defaults here is retention time of a week and unlimited class size, which fits the bill here because my Kafka cluster will disappear within two days anyway. So I can just keep it here for a week. When my Kafka cluster disappears, my storage disappears, so I lose everything anyway. So let's keep it here for a week. And unlimited retention, that's nice as well. Uh, I think as part of the developer program, you have 60 gigs of storage. I'm, def I'm definitely not gonna send 60 gigs of messages today to my topic, so I can keep it to unlimited. And then the last screen is more informative in the sense that you cannot, at least not as part of the development preview program, you cannot change those parameters, but this has to do with replication. So uh, also very nice feature of Apache Kafka is this Apache Kafka has been designed with high availability in mind. And one of the high availability aspects is that topics are replicated. So a Kafka instance, in itself is typically a, a number of brokers. So with OpenShift streams, the number of brokers is three. So every Kafka instance has three brokers. So, and, uh, so that means that every topic can be replicated three times. So if, uh, and this is the default here. So every topic has three replicas. So that means that every message in every topic will have three replicas one replica on every broker node, which means that even if I lose two brokers, if something really bad is happening in, in, uh, on this uh, hosted service and two brokers go, go, go down, my Kafka instance will, st will still work fine and I won't have any loss of data because I have three replicas. So I can suffer a loss of two Kafka brokers. And then the minimum in sync is important for producers so if i produce a message from the moment that the kafka broker has replicated the that message to at least one other replica it will acknowledge the reception to the producer and then in the background replicate it to the third uh, to the third uh, node so this is what those numbers say so every topic has replica number of three and an in-sync replica of two, uh, that's for acknowledgement to the producers. But I cannot change those, this is more informative. So if I click finish, you will see I have my first Kafka topic here, one partition, seven days retention, unlimited retention size, just as I configured it. And then I can create other topics. So later on, we're gonna create another topic, but for now, we're gonna stick with this one. If I go back to my quick start, I basically did all this. So I have my topic ready. So if I click next, is a new Kafka topic listed in the topics table? Yes, it is. I'm ready to continue. And this is the end of the first quick start where we basically created the Kafka instance, created the service account and created the first topic. So now we can start doing something with that Kafka instance, which leads us to the second uh, quick start. 
And you find the link. So we ordered the quick start in such a way that at the end of each quick start, you have a media link to the next one in the logical sequence of those quick starts. So the next quick start is about using Kafka Cut to connect to our Kafka instance and produce and consume some messages. So if I click on this one, this is the next. So it shows all green because I went to the uh, the the quick start myself to rehearse for today, yesterday. So that's why it shows that I've already done all the steps, but I can do them again. So the first thing is using Kafka Cut. So now, so what is Kafka Cut? Kafka Cut is a command a command line utility, which is not it's not a Red Hat utility. It's a Apache. Kafka community utility, but which is very popular. So it's a command line, which uh, is uh, very simple to use and which allows you to test out. And uh, so if you have provisioned somewhere, a Kafka instance, be it hosted, like the one that we're doing now, it can be on-premise, it can be a local Docker container, uh, whatever. If you want to verify that your, your, uh, your Kafka instance is working as expected, Kafka Cut is a very useful utility. You can easily connect to a Kafka instance. You can uh, you can list the topics that you have. You can send messages to a topic. You can consume from a topic. So very useful tool in when you just get started with the Kafka instance to verify that everything is working as expected before you start doing more serious things. Uh, you can at least make sure that you're good to go. So that's what we're gonna do now. Normally. You install Kafka Cut uh, on your local machine. And so it's a command line tool and then you start working with it. Now for this workshop, that would probably be a little bit difficult because uh, if things go wrong, it would be a bit hard to debug what's wrong on your machine. So to make things a little bit easier for you, we're gonna actually deploy a container on the dev sandbox that has Kafka Cut installed. And then we're gonna use the terminal of that, of the pod that we're gonna deploy to actually interact with Kafka Cut. So to do that, we need to, uh, I need to go to the developer here. Okay, my developer perspective, and I'm gonna deploy a, uh, a image. So there is, if you're on the topology view, you see normally this view, you have like this cart container image. So if I click on this, this is to deploy a pod from an existing image. So in the quick start, you see this thing here, quay.io Rosac Rose Tools. This is the image that we're gonna use. It has Kafka Cat, it has the Rose CLI. So when Evan takes over from me, he's gonna use the same deployment. Uh, so if I copy this and I put this here, it's gonna validate that that image actually exists. So, and then I'm, I, I can keep the same runtime icon. I'm gonna do that as a deployment. So a regular OpenShift or Kubernetes deployment. And I don't need a route because I'm, a route is to access an application from outside of the cluster, but I'm just gonna use it as a terminal if you want. So I don't need a route, so I can just create the image here. Oh, I did that yesterday, so I forgot to delete my image stream. So I'm gonna do quickly something which you normally should not have to do, and that is delete my image streams, because otherwise this Okay, I should be good to go now. I think I will have to do that again. Yes. Okay. Good. Open shift. I don't need a route. Create. That's better. So now you see here that this uh, this container is being downloaded from Quay. It's being deployed, and when that blue circle becomes dark blue the application is running. And now I can go into the application 
actually into that pot, into the terminal, and start playing with uh, with Kafka Cut. So to do so, I click here in the middle. This will open a, uh, a detail screen for my deployment. On the resources tab, which opens by default, you can see that I have one pot for this deployment. If I click on that pot, on that link for that pot, it will lead me to the pot details screen. The one that I'm interested in of all those steps for now is the terminal. So this will open a terminal inside that pot. Okay, so now it's as if I have Kafka Cut installed locally, but and I would do it through a local terminal. Now I have a terminal directly in the pot that has Kafka Cut. And to verify that, I can do a simple command just to make sure that everything works as expected. If I do Kafka Cut dash V, you will show me that indeed I have Kafka Cut installed version 1.6.0, which is the version that I expect. Okay, so I, I'm ready to start using Kafka Cut to connect to my Kafka instance. Okay, so to now I want to use Kafka Cut to connect to my hosted Kafka instance. So for that, obviously, Kafka Cut needs to know where is my Kafka running. So it needs that bootstrap URL that I copied before. And it needs my service account, client ID, and client secret to act as username and password to actually be able to allow, to allow me to do something with my Kafka cluster and to be able to connect. So to make my life easier, I'm going to set a couple of uh, environment variables in my terminal so that I can refer to those. So the first one is the, oh, sorry. The first one is the bootstrap server. And I'm going to copy it from the text editor that I have open on another screen, which is the value. So paste. So that was my bootstrap server. OK. I'm going to do so. Kafka Cat has the notion of user and password. So, uh, which translates to the client ID and the client secrets. So, the user is the client ID. So, that's the thing from the service account that starts with service account. Well, actually, a bit abbreviated. So, the user, the username is SRVC account, and then this generated string. And then we have the, uh, the password, which is the secret. Password is, which is this one. There we go. So now if I do Kafka cat command, I can very easily refer to these environment variables and re re reuse those. Okay, so I've done that. I can move on. So the first thing that we're going to do is produce some messages, and then we're going to consume them. So basically, with Kafka cat, you can connect to a uh, Kafka instance in producer mode. And just type some text in the uh, at the command line, and every line of text becomes a message that is sent to a particular topic. So in the quick start, you have this command. So if I, so, which is Kafka cat this minus t is which topic you want to connect to, which is my first Kafka topic topic that I created before. The dash b is for the Bootstrap server. So I'm reusing my environment variable as a security protocol and that's how the hosted uh, kafka so the open open shift streams is being set up it uses sazzle ssl so the connection is encrypted it's over ssl and it uses plain so that means a username and a password uh, so the user is client id the password is the client secret i could have used or OpenShift Streams also supports 
OAuth Beer, so that's an, a, an, o, an uh, OAuth uh, authentication flow, but Kafka Cat doesn't support that at the moment, so I cannot use this one. So I'm going to stick to the plane. Okay, I copy that command, paste. So at the, the dash P at the end means producer mode. So that means I'm, I'll be able to send some messages to my topic. So I do enter and then you just see he's, uh, my prompt is waiting for some input. So if I do something like my first message and I do enter, this will send a message to my topic. If I don't see something, an error message popping up, I can be fairly confident that this went okay and my topic now has a first message. Let's do, let's do a second message and a third one. Message. Then I could go on and on and on, but that would become boring, right? So after three messages, I'm satisfied. So I can do control C and enter to leave producer mode. So now I have, or I expect to have three messages on my Kafka topic, on my sole partition, because remember, I only have one partition. So those three messages ended up on my sole partition. So I should be able to consume them now. Uh, and that's the next step in the quick start. So which basically I'm gonna consume the messages, which basically uses more or less so Kafka Cut in consumer mode. So the only different only difference with the previous command is that in the end it says minus C instead of minus P. So the C stands for consumer. So now the topic is the same, the bootstrap and the security setup is the same. So I copy this whole command, paste it into my terminal, paste, I do enter. And there you see, he consumed my three messages. Okay, first message, second message, third message, and then you get an informative message saying I reached the end of the topic. If now I would have another window with Kafka Cat open and would continue produce, I could continue consume here as well. So I would see almost in real time because that's the beauty of Kafka is that uh, Kafka is, uh, is very, very fast. So almost in real time, I would see, I would consume messages that I, that I produce. But I only have one window open so uh, uh, I can close my consumer here. I reach. I uh, I consumed all the messages that are, are on that are available on the topic. So let's do Control C and that and I consume. So yes, I could consume the messages, and my consumer displayed my three messages. And with that, I'm at the end of. Uh, the second quick start, and this is the signal for Evan to take over. So I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen. I see that Evan is waiting. So uh, stop sharing, yes, and up to you, Evan. Yeah, let me uh, get my sharing working here. All right. Oh, wow. It takes the main screen, I guess. <laughs> so let me move stuff around. You should be go. able to choose, no? Uh, yeah, it didn't give me an option. That was weird. Usually stuff like gives you the option. Yeah, I didn't get an option. Let me, let me try it again. Let me see if I can change it. Hello? No. Oh, wait. Now it's... Oh, wow. It uses... Okay, I got it. It uses the screen that I have uh, <clears throat> active at that time. There we go. Now I have much more room, so that looks okay. Yeah, there we go. All right, so I'm going to take off like Bernard said, where he left off. Um, so Bernard has shown us 
some really cool basics about how to get started with the service, create topics, and given also a really good overview of Kafka in general, which was fantastic. So I'm after been following along with Bernard. So I already, as you can see, have my tools image running here. And you can see I have my Kafka instance created, and I also have a service account created. So um, I'm ready to dive in now to a new quick start. So if I go over here to the add menu here, I actually have it open, but just to show one more time, if you want to follow along with this quick start where we're going to show how to deploy an application, head here to quick starts in your OpenShift environment, view all quick starts. And the one I'm going to show right now is this one. So connecting to Red Hat OpenShift streams or connecting Red Hat OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka to OpenShift. So the first thing in this guide is getting the tools started. Thankfully, Bernard has already showed us how to do that. So we don't need to do it again. So I'll just go with the uh, next option here. And after that, it tells us we need to go over to our topology view and go to the pod because we're going to be executing some commands with those tools. So I'm already logged in and I can verify that by just doing a rows Kafka list. So I should be able to see my Kafka instances. So I'm good to go there. And also, I need to make sure I'm logged into the OpenShift command line. So I think Bernard might have already showed this as well, but you can get the login token up here in the top right by clicking the copy login command. And once you do, you just paste it in here again. And once you do, you should be able to view your projects. And you can see I can view my projects. So I'm ready to go. Um, so now to actually start using our Kafka instance that we created, for example, example, my one over here is called Workshop. To use that with a Quarkus or a Node or a Python or whatever your favorite runtime application is, we need to connect it with our OpenShift cluster here. So to do that, we can use the ROAS cluster connect command. And it, it's explained over here on the right. It's just a single line command. And what that's going to do <clears throat> is it's going to ask us which of our Kafka instances we want to connect. So in these workshop and development preview accounts, you only have one instance. So uh, it's pretty easy to make the choice here. But you know, in the future, when the service is GA and when we up the limits, people will have more instances and they can choose specific instances that they wish to link into their projects on OpenShift or um, you know, Kubernetes. So I'll go ahead, follow the prompts. And once again, this asks me for a offline token. So that's the token that I can get from cloud.redhat.com. So I'll copy the URL here and just open it in my browser. And I should get a token, which I do. I'll paste it in here. And what that does is it then creates um, a Kafka connection uh, custom resource in my OpenShift project. So Evan, see down here. Evan, do you hear me? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, it seems your 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 font is a bit small for people to follow. Oh, uh, too small. In the term. Is that any better? That for me, that's a lot better. So. Uh, Okay, so if, if it's still too small, just let me know, but hopefully yeah. this is better. Um, so as you can see, I ran the cluster connect command, and what that did was it created what's known as a Kafka connection, which is a custom resource in our cluster. So we can then do an OC get on the Kafka connection to verify it was created, even though the CLI is telling us it was. So if we check here, you can now see a Kafka connection has been created, and it's the name it's named after the Kafka instance you connected. And if you describe it, so for example, if we do an OC describe Kafka connection and the name of the connection then, so workshop, it prints out lots of interesting information that's useful for our applications, right? So if we scroll up here, we can see <clears throat> it tells us the SASL mechanism to use when our applications are connecting to the instance. It also tells us things like the bootstrap server host, and there's also some credentials here that you can see, and they're in a secret. So that's the cloud services service account secret. So for example, if we do an OC get secrets here, you can see that a few seconds ago, 
that new secret was created. Um, and if we actually get the secret itself, we should be able to see that it contains two properties if we describe it. And you can see that's the client ID in secret. So Bernard showed you how to create that using the uh, UI earlier. Um, and those are used by your application to connect to the Kafka instance. So I'm happy that that's working. So I can go on to the next step here. And the next step is <clears throat> inspecting it, which I just showed you. And I was quite happy that that worked well. So that's it. We've connected our instance now to OpenShift. And our applications will now be able to uh, use what's known as a service binding to read this information in and connect to our Kafka instance and produce and consume messages. So that's what I'm going to show you in a moment now. So I'll go on to the next um, exercise here and show you how to uh, bind a Quarkus application to the Kafka instance that we created earlier. And I'm just heading straight into the next tutorial here, as you can see on the right. And what it's going to do is it's asking me to deploy a pre-built Quarkus application. So you can see here there is a pre-built container image available on key.io. So similar to the tools image we deployed earlier, I'll just go ahead and deploy this Quarkus application. So to do that, I need to go over to the add menu on the left here. And I'm going to choose to deploy from a pre-built container image. And I can just paste in the image URL here, and it should validate, which it did. And it is a Quarkus application, so I'll make sure it has a nice Quarkus icon to identify it. And then um, <clears throat> we can leave everything here at the defaults, um, leave it as a deployment. And we do want to expose a route to the application so we can access it using our web browser in a moment. So the instructions tell us to leave all that stuff at the defaults and just go ahead and click the Create button. And when we do that, OpenShift will start to spin up a pod based on that container image. So if I click on this new pod here, the Quarkus one, you can see it spun up within a, few, within a few seconds. And it also tells me here I should open the prices endpoint. So if I click on, I went a bit quick there, but I clicked on this open URL button, and that will open the endpoint for this Quarkus application in a new browser window. And you can see it's up and running now. And if I go to the prices endpoint, what this application does is it basically randomly generates uh, kind of like stock prices or the price of a product, right? So you can see here that the last price is it's currently not defined because we haven't actually yet bound this application to that Kafka uh, connection information. There's one more step we need to do to make sure this application can connect to Kafka and read in prices from our topic. So to do that, again, it's actually really nice and easy thanks to the tooling created by the product team here. So let's go on to the next step that explains how to do that. Essentially, there's two things we need to do. I haven't yet created a prices topic, and I also need to bind my application. So to create that topic, I can go here to the Kafka Streams UI, or sorry, the OpenShift Streams UI, and select my Kafka instance. My internet connection is having trouble, I think. <laughs> I'll refresh. All right, there we go. Uh, so I'll click on my instance here, and it'll give me the option to create a topic. And I'll just go and create a topic named prices, since that's what the guide or this application expects. I'll go ahead and use the defaults, uh, just a single partition again, and go with the default retention uh, time and size, and again, uh, we apply those sensible uh, replication and in sync replica values by default. So I'm perfectly happy with that. So now I have my topic created. I just need to bind my application now, my Quarkus application, to the Kafka connection for it to be able to produce and consume uh, those prices so we can display them in the UI in this application. So I'm happy now that I have that topic. I'll go ahead and click Next. And I also have the CLI tools already configured from the previous uh, steps. So I can just skip that section and scroll down here to the, uh, the uh, instructions. <clears throat> and you can see here in the instructions, basically what I need to do is go to my Quarkus tools or my, my Rose tools pod, open it up. And what we're going to do here is 
We're going to use that row as cluster command again. But this time, we're going to use the sub command named bind. And what the bind command does is it will ask us uh, which particular instance, which is our Kafka instance that we want to bind to which particular uh, deployment running in our OpenShift project. So naturally, I want, to I want to bind the workshop instance I created to the Quarkus Kafka quick start application I just deployed. So I'll follow the prompts to do that. And that creates a service binding. So if we now do an OC get service binding, you can see we have this new service binding that was just created. And that that does some some work for us automatically. So if I was quick, I should have came back to this topology view. Um, but where this Quarkus application just restarted, um, I just you didn't see it because I was inside that other pod. But if we go to uh, the logs for this application and we scroll up, you can see uh, it restarted at 15, 19, 20, which is just a few moments ago. And if we scroll down into the logs here, you can see it's uh, successfully running and it says uh, the producer is connected to a cluster, which is the Kafka cluster. So now if we go and refresh the UI, after a few seconds, there's a timer in this application where it generates data, it generates numbers. And you can see there the first number came through, right? So that number was produced to Kafka and the application also is a consumer and it reads those numbers back and prints them here to the UI in real time. And if we go back here to the application logs, you can see that as soon as I uh, refresh the application in my browser, it started to produce those prices. And you can see it has things like the uh, offsets and the partition information being printed here. So it's very straightforward using the uh, OpenShift Streams UI to create Kafka instances and create your topics and your partitions. And then you can use our CLI tooling either directly in OpenShift, as you can see us doing here, or on your local machine to create the bindings and connections between your OpenShift projects and your Kafka instance running on cloud.redhat.com. And that more or less concludes my section of the guide. Bernard has introduced you really nicely to the product, and I've given you a quick introduction to how to bind and connect your Kafka instances to your applications here in OpenShift or Kubernetes. I think with that, we're uh, ready to wrap up the, uh, at least ready to wrap up this piece of the, uh, the event. Sure. Uh, give me one second. I'll stop I think I can. Screen, by the way. Yes. Yeah, we can do that. So I hope you guys enjoyed the workshop. Um, so basically, what's next? Uh, we want you can keep trying the service. Um, the Kafka instances, uh, you can require a Kafka instance at no cost and zero commitments after you finish your workshop. It's exactly the same process that you run through today. Um, so once this one, this one is going to last for about 48 hours, depending when you created it. Uh, then you can recreate another one. You can keep using the service as well as the sandbox. You can go back and request another sandbox for your OpenShift and keep trying different use cases. A couple of things. I didn't put it here. This is my um, fault, but if you give me one second, I'll share something with you. So we're running two Dev Nation talks with our friend uh, Edson um, in the coming days. So give me one second here. So in July 8th, we're running a Dev Nation talk to demonstrate um, concepts for the concept for change data capture. So how you can use Divisium and Kafka Connect and also using our managed Kafka service. That's happening July 8th. And in July 22nd, we are doing a use case with Kate Native on OpenShift. And you're also going to see how you can uh, process events sourced from Apache Kafka when you have a serverless application. So. All the information is going to be sent out to you by email, so, but 
keep checking the um, a newsletter and our notes, the, keep going to the website and you're gonna see more things coming along your way on Kafka. Uh, the service is gonna be launched by the end of the year. Uh, finally, please uh, remember to, um, if you can, please give us feedback, sign up. Uh, here's the link, give us um, any ideas, any feedbacks that you have on how we can keep shaping the future of Red Hat products. Uh, we are really looking to know what you're thinking, what you enjoy, um, let us know. And we thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the workshop. If you have questions or anything, please reach out to us um, and we will be happy um, to keep sharing content and information with you. I don't know if there are any questions left on the chat, uh, but if not, thank you so much all for coming. Uh, there was one, Jennifer. Yeah. If, do you have links for those definition sessions? Uh, no. We will be sharing them. You will be getting an email after this workshop in a few minutes today, tomorrow, um, and the links for registering to the, the, the those talks are gonna be shared there. But I think Edson has also some feedback. You wanted to say, Edson? Yeah, I think the registration links for the tech talks are not uh, ready yet, but if you, you can always check uh, this particular URL that I'm sharing on the chat. I mean, the end.dev slash upcoming. You always have the, the newest and greatest things uh, that we're going to present at the nation. And if you register for the developer sandbox and you accepted our newsletter, you always have notifications on when we have upcoming tech talks. All right, uh, any more questions? Oh, I can see here DJ Maddie saying a very important bookmark. Uh, for Dev Nation. Yes, thank you, DJ Maddie. And okay, last call. If you have any more questions, you have five seconds to give it a try, or else we'll just wish everybody a great rest of the day, evening. And well, once again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Evan, for this amazing DevNation workshop. I hope you enjoyed everything that you've seen today. And don't forget to try the developer sandbox by yourself. See you soon.